the Greater Centerville Historians, organized in the year 2000. The purpose of the organization is to preserve the history of the Township of Centerville, Cleveland and surrounding area. Gerald O'Neill, Charlie Bauer, Richard Wiegand, and myself, Kathleen Sixel, were the founding members. In 1831, the territory south of Green Bay was sold to the U.S. government by the Native Americans who had title to the land. The consideration was the promise of a reservation in another state. The township of Centerville was established in 1850. The township had a village called Centerville. The reason for the hamlet's original name of Centerville was, in the days of the Indians, there was a trail along Lake Michigan between Manitowoc and Sheboygan. This heavenly spot was exactly at the halfway mark, so the early white man gave it the name Centerville. In 1849, the village of Centerville was surveyed and laid out in lots and blocks. The village of Centerville was renamed Hyka when the postmaster general informed the village leaders that another Centerville was located in the state. When it became time for Centerville to be renamed, a judge in Manitowoc by the name of Albert Schmidt would take kids hiking. The judge said, you can't call a town hiking, so why not make it Hyka? Thus the village of Centerville became Hyka. In the early years, Centerville had the vision of becoming a lake port. To encourage ships to dock there, two piers were built into Lake Michigan. Many German immigrants arrived by schooners and the village began to grow. The village had a brick factory, stores, schools, a Lutheran and a Catholic church, mill, saloons, blacksmith shop, and a fire department, and a brewery. When the brewery was built, the settlement began to flourish. But when fire destroyed the brewery, the largest industry, there was no longer a need for the harbor facilities. So ended this chapter of the development of Haika. Two miles west of Haika, another settlement known as St. Wendell began to grow. It had a Catholic church, a general store with a connected dance hall, and a post office was also located in the complex, a funeral parlor, and at one time a motel. With the clearing of the forest, tilling of the land began. This prompted the exporting of lumber and grains. The farmers of Centerville looked forward to the building of a railway since they had a serious problem transporting their products. In 1873, the Milwaukee, Lakeshore and Western Railroad was built between the settlements of Hyka and St. Wendell and was named Centerville Station. In 1880, Centerville Station was renamed Cleveland after President Rover Cleveland. Cleveland, at that point in time, owes its growth to the fact that the township of Centerville was a rich farming community and farmers from miles around would bring products to be shipped by rail or ship. The village of Cleveland had several grocery stores, a furniture store, a funeral parlor, several saloons, Lutheran church, hardware stores, several gas stations, newspaper, photographer studio, several car dealerships, cheese factory, several feed mills, livestock yard and lumber yards. The biggest business was the Cleveland Co-op, which offered many types of services. With the feeling of green crops, the farmers began dairy farming. With the abundance of milk, another industry began, cheese and butter making. Local cheese factories dotted the countryside. One-room schools were usually built near the cheese factories, so children would have a ride to school when farmers brought their milk. In 1958, Hyka, St. Wendell, and Cleveland incorporated into the village of Cleveland. In 1968, the Cleveland Elementary School was built. The township of Centerville has seen many farming changes, but dairy farming is still the primary vocation. Today, Cleveland is known as the seat of Lakeshore Technical College, which offers an educational alternative to four-year colleges. An ancient proverb states, 
When an old person dies, a library burns to the ground. These words were the inspiration for organizing the Greater Centerville Historians. We hope to preserve as many memories as possible. Businessmen were heroes in the 1920s and they predicted a future of constantly rising wealth. Advancing technology, they believed, would increase productivity and create new products. Advertising would persuade consumers to buy them. Greater demand for products would expand industry, which would then pay workers higher wages, enabling them to buy more. A consumer society with more leisure was developing. The hope was that everyone would be better off. Business volume expanded rapidly. One item being sold as never before was automobiles. Automobile production became critical to American industry and transformed American society. Times were good, but if the combination of steady growth and business confidence didn't hold, Americans of the 1920s would have only their savings to fall back on. There was no social security, no unemployment benefits, no guaranteed government commitment to help in time of need. There was only private charity and the voluntary efforts of businesses and communities. Labor unions couldn't help much either. Organized labor lost ground during the 1920s. Some skilled workers belonged to unions, but management wasn't obligated to negotiate with or even recognize unions. And some owners automatically fired workers who joined them. Despite the boom, the income gap between rich and poor was high. Production of goods was beginning to outstrip ordinary people's ability to buy them. Trouble had already begun to appear on the farm. Farmers were producing more than people were buying. Farm prices were low, but farm costs were high. It was a sign of weakness in the economy. In 1928, Herbert Hoover was elected president of the United States. Hoover was the leading politician working for a new day in which business, labor, and government would voluntarily cooperate to end poverty in the United States. With the genuine prosperity of the 1920s came a stock market boom that more and more people bought into. Stocks could be bought on margin, only 10% of the purchase price down. Even banks speculated on the market with their depositors' money. In the 1920s, the government was not inclined to regulate the stock market, banking, and business practices. 
No one wanted to believe that the boom couldn't continue indefinitely. In October of 1929, the stock market crashed. The crash toppled the pyramid of debt in the whole country as each creditor demanded what was owed. Banks tied to the stock market by their own speculation and by their loans to brokers were seriously weakened. Some banks ran out of money and closed when hard-pressed depositors began making withdrawals. When people heard of the failure of one bank, they rushed to their own bank to get their money, until it too had paid out all its funds and had to close. The panic spread. I'm addressing myself to the Senate on this occasion as the major questions under By 1933, are now the your banking budget. system was on the National verge of collapse. Of but every fair. action the federal government took seemed only to make matters worse. The Depression was not a sudden catastrophe. It moved slowly, affecting certain segments of the population while sparing others. The forgotten man was the worker who lost his job. With no jobs and no income, workers stopped buying radios, new clothes and furniture, and stopped putting money in banks to be loaned to other businesses. Companies that had weathered the first phase of the depression began to fail. The crisis spread from business to business, just as it had spread from bank to bank. One quarter of the workforce lost their jobs in the 1930s, which was a disaster of unheard of proportions, but it still left many people untouched. Some industries proved to be depression-proof, like the movies. The film industry was one of the biggest in the United States. People wanted to escape. There was always a quarter for the movies. Come, everybody get dressed. Ready for the opening. Oh, hurry, girl, take a snap. Action. Come on. This depression was worldwide. The collapse of the U.S. economy triggered an economic collapse in other countries, too. In Europe, the response to the depression was often a radical rejection of capitalism and democracy. In Germany, Adolf Hitler began his rise to power with promises to remake the economy so that it served the working people. By 1932, everyone, it seems, knew someone who had lost a job or their home or had their business fail. Soup kitchens and bread lines for the unemployed and homeless became familiar sights. They were paid for by private charities and community relief programs. There were no federal programs. Unfortunately, the private charities' funds were quickly drying up, just when the demands on them were multiplying. To be unable to support yourself or your family, to fail to hold a job, was a source of deep shame for most Americans of the time. Many people tried to hide their poverty, especially if they had to take charity or relief. In 
In order to qualify for charitable welfare, you often couldn't own a car or a telephone or even have a radio. This welfare was just enough to keep the poor from starvation. They were thought to deserve no more. In some states, people on welfare were not allowed to vote. There had been depressions before. The difference in the 1930s was that the bad times went on and on, month after month, year after year. On the outskirts of many cities, permanent shanty towns grew up. Blaming the president for not providing relief, people called them Hoovervilles. After three years of severe depression, farmers were driven to active protest. Farm product prices had fallen along with the prices of everything else. Desperate farmers organized boycotts, blocked roads so produce couldn't reach markets. When a farmer's mortgage was foreclosed, his neighbors sometimes conspired to buy it at auction for next to nothing and then give it back to the farmer. There were organized marches on Washington by the unemployed, demanding relief, jobs, a change in the government's attitude. The largest organized march was the Bonus Army. The government had promised World War I veterans a bonus for their service, to be paid in 1945. In 1932, veterans marched on Washington and demanded that their bonus be paid now. 15,000 protesters eventually arrived in Washington. The vets were orderly, peaceful. Many had brought their wives and children. Hoover believed that the Bonus Army was stirred up by communists. He refused even to see the protest leaders. When the army under General Douglas MacArthur ran the vets out of town with tanks and tear gas, Hoover took the blame. Nineteen thirty-two was an election year. The Republicans had held the presidency since nineteen twenty, but Hoover and the Republicans were held responsible for the crash and the depression. It seemed certain a Democrat would be elected this year. And there can be no more dependable means to this end than the re-election of Herbert Hoover as president of the United States. Upon word of his nomination, Governor Roosevelt broke all precedent the way he had by flying to Chicago. The country was thrilled to this news. Franklin D. Roosevelt of New York, 50 years old and physically disabled after contracting polio. You have nominated me. And I know it. And I am here to thank you for the honor. Roosevelt's acceptance speech was the first to be broadcast nationwide. I pledge myself to a new deal for the American people. Roosevelt's platform and his plans were not really very different from Hoover's. He too believed in a balanced budget. Like Hoover, Roosevelt believed that confidence was necessary to get America out of the Depression. But while Hoover believed that confidence in business was paramount, Roosevelt believed that the hope and confidence of all Americans had to be restored.
FDR himself radiated confidence. On the radio, in the new sound newsreels, FDR inspired confidence in the American people. Who decline the defeatist attitude, join tirelessly with me in the work of advancing to a better ordered economic life. My friends, the time has come. The hour has struck. Like Hoover in 28, Roosevelt won by a landslide. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Another difference between Hoover and Roosevelt was Roosevelt's willingness to experiment with solutions. To stave off the collapse of the banking system, he ordered all the banks in the United States to close for four days, a bank holiday. When banks reopened, deposits exceeded withdrawals. Roosevelt gathered around him a group of men and women with ideas. Because many of them came from the academic world, they came to be called the Brains Trust. Roosevelt asked them for innovative solutions to hunger, unemployment, and the larger problem, reviving the United States economy. Solutions to unemployment depended on government spending, an unpopular idea with Republicans and Democrats alike. One solution Hoover had also believed in was public works programs, putting people to work for the government. The Civilian Conservation Corps, CCC, put young unmarried men to work doing conservation projects on government lands. Every month, they were required to send home some of their pay so that many different communities benefited a little. The New Deal was less successful when it attempted to change the way the United States economy worked. The NRA, National Recovery Administration, attempted to regulate wages and prices throughout the U.S., industry by industry. Symbolized by a blue eagle, the NRA gave people hope that the government, through businesses, could improve economic conditions. But the NRA failed to revive the economy. In 1935, for giving too much power to the executive branch, the NRA was declared unconstitutional. The Works Projects Administration, WPA, put men and women to work on public work programs. They built more than half a million miles of highways, streets, and roads and over a hundred thousand public buildings. They built parks, bridges, and airports across the country. WPA workers created and ran nursery schools and health programs. The WPA also put actors, artists, and writers to work. It was the first government sponsorship of the arts preserving our ethnic, regional, and cultural heritage, producing plays, painting murals in public spaces. These projects cost the government more than direct aid, but people preferred a job to a handout. The Agricultural Adjustment Act, AAA, paid farmers not to plant crops, and to destroy surplus crops and livestock in order to raise prices and farm incomes. The AAA, like the NRA, was declared unconstitutional, 
Though the farm price support system of today descends from these attempts to regulate agricultural production. Today, depression is a fading memory. Millions of men and women have found employment and with it confidence and hope. The government employed sophisticated propaganda techniques to convince the American people that the New Deal programs were good Americanism, that they helped ordinary people who really wanted work and not a handout to become independent again. The depression was made harder by bad weather. Floods and drought took an even greater toll because of careless or ignorant use of land and other natural resources. Beginning in 1930, there were serious droughts in the Great Plains. Combined with weeks of high winds, the resulting dust storms covered whole states and turned the Great Plains into a dust bowl. Hundreds of thousands of farmers in Oklahoma, Arkansas, Kansas, and Texas gave up, left the land, and went on the road hoping for a new start in California. The ecological disasters were one cause of another government initiative. The Tennessee Valley Authority explained how it improved life for the people of this impoverished rural area. First came the dams. Up on the clinch at the head of the river, we built Norris Dam, a great barrier to hold water in flood time and to release water down the river for navigation in low water season. Next came Wheeler, then Guntersville, and Pickwick and Chickamauga. A series of great barriers that eventually will transform the old Tennessee into a link of freshwater pools. Locked and dammed, regulated and controlled, down 650 miles to Paducah. Ideas for change didn't all come from the government. Often FDR and his advisors were only responding to pressure from radical political groups and the growing militant labor movement. Then there were violent and even murderous strikes in many industries as labor fought for recognition and the right of workers to belong to unions, for better pay and conditions, for pensions. the 1930s, the labor movement won a place in the American political scene. This was one of the most significant social and economic changes in the United States. Unions and union membership became an accepted part of American life. The pressure of the labor movement and left-wing critics pushed the government into establishing laws and agencies that today we take for granted. The Wagner Act, which guarantees the right to organize unions and compels industries to negotiate with them. Social Security, the first government pension program.
At the beginning of the Depression, individual communities were thought to be responsible for their less fortunate members. By the end of it, the federal government was seen as the only agent with the power to help those who could not help themselves. The experience of the Great Depression and the programs of the New Deal with its propaganda films and information efforts helped to change our definition of what it is to be an American and what the role of the federal government in American life is. To provide old age pensions and public health measures, to care for the environment, to settle disputes between competing groups, to regulate the economy. But did the programs of the New Deal end the Depression? No. In no year between 1930 and 1940 did unemployment fall below 8 million. Many of the neediest groups in the United States were not helped by social programs. Migrant laborers, black people, non-union workers, the rural poor. The Depression really ended in America when war began in Europe. American industry began to produce arms and military supplies in huge quantities. The United States, President Roosevelt said, must become the great arsenal of democracy. American workers turned eagerly to defense production. The future looked dark. It seemed likely that soon the United States, too, would be at war. But after more than 10 years of idleness and waste, it was good to be back at work again.
Okay, today's date is July 12th, and we're here at LTC for our Greater Centerville Historians meeting in regard to the Great Depression. Uh, tonight we don't have a presenter, so everybody in the room is going to be presenter, and we want to know what you remember about the Depression or what you learned from your parents, what took place during the Depression. We know what happened at the national level, but we don't know what happened locally. So, and, and what I did, I did a lot of research at the library, I went through a lot of films, about five or six hours of films, and I found a, about a half hour little clip that was done by National Geographic, it's very informative, it's a black and white one, and it covers some of the highlights, and it, it might trip some of your memories of something that probably happened locally here too. And with all that, I'm gonna turn the microphone over to Kathy, and then we can start our meeting. Welcome everybody to the Greater Centerville Historians. It was a beautiful day today, maybe a little bit hot, and it's July 12, 2010. Okay. And, um, well, we can start with Charlie. Oh, we gotta have the picture. We want to, uh, we put the picture of Richard Wiegan, who was an organizer of this organization, and his new bride. I think Richard got married July 19th, correct? June. Oh, June, June 19th, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, and he got married up in Spooner, Wisconsin. So, we wish him well. <laughs> so, very nice picture of him. Okay. Okay. And you'd like to introduce yourself? Introductions. Um, I'm Kathy Sixel, and I live in Newton, Wisconsin. Very good. Thank you. Paul Jacoby, Cleveland, Wisconsin. Okay. Thank you. Lisa Alson, Newton. Thank you. Albert Yeager, Chibani. Thank you. Rick Firestorf, Mimi. Thank you. Kathy Wagner, Cleveland. Thank you. Walter Chris, Cleveland. Good. Thank you. Naomi Schmidt, Elkhart Lake. Thank you. Murray Welfel, Kale. Thank you. Don Schneider, Lewis Corners. Thank you. Larry Brookshin, Cleveland. Thank you. Uh, Melvin Walk, Town Schleswig. Thank you. Elaine Walk, Town of Schleswig. Good, thank you. Willard Mathias, Cleveland. Thank you. Alice Mathias, Cleveland. Irene Dine, Cleveland. Thank you. Audrey Erdl, St. Nazians. Very good. <coughs> Earl Alder, Town of Centerville. Thank you. John Wiegand, Town of Centerville. Good. Marilyn Heineman, Howard's Grove. Thank you. Selma Vogel, Cleveland. Thank you. Marie Pepper, Cleveland. Good. Edith, <coughs> Edith let's see, Cleveland. Thank you. <coughs> Frederick Jacoby, Manitowoc. Thank you. Charlie Bauer, Newton. Very good, thank you. Announcement, uh, we all offer our, our sympathy to Naomi Schmidt, whose husband passed away June 29th. So you have our sympathy, Naomi. Okay. Good. What I did was I uh, a little lo little softer, Charlie. Am I too loud, Jerry? <laughs> that better? There better. we go. That's good. Okay. I copied the front page of the Manitowoc paper, October 24, 1929, when the stock market crashed. I'm gonna back this up a little bit here. And their big concern was about the car ferry with that went down in Milwaukee. And they got a, just a little ad right here. And I went about a week or so on these. When they, when they said that uh, the stock market, here's a little bit about the stock market again. It, it was a very slow process. And, and I was always under the impression when the stock market crashed, everybody was broke. But uh, apparently it didn't happen that way. It was a very slow progress, I guess. And the other thing that I, I'm going to just pass all these newspaper articles around here. They're, they're quite interesting if you if you get a little time here just to look at them. But they spent a lot of time just on the, the car ferry, a little bit on the stock market, especially it was just it was just small articles, nothing nothing, no headlines whatsoever. 
let's let's do it this way. How many people here in the room? I'm not asking who voted for Roosevelt. How many people heard Roosevelt's speech, his, his nomination speech? Can I see the hands? Did any, anybody listen to it on the radio? We got one back here, Walter. Anybody else? Oh. Okay. If, let's. Okay, how far back can we go with the presidents? If we go backwards here, I can go all the way back, and I remember Eisenhower. That's, that's as far as back I go. And before Eisenhower was Truman. We got any nods of Truman? Okay. Then Franklin Roosevelt. Herbert Hoover. Anybody on Her Herbert Hoover? How about Calvin Coolidge, then? <laughs> that, get, that gets pretty far back there, huh? <laughs> and some of, the, some of the, the programs were mentioned on the, on the little film here we watched that, the, the, that Roosevelt started to get the economy going. And like he said, the, the CCC, the Civilian Conversational Corps, and then he had the FERA, the Federal Emergency Relief Administration, the WPA, the Works Progress Administration, then he had the AAA, the Agricultural Adjustment Administration, then he had the NRA, the National Recovery Administration, he had the, the PWA, the Public Works Administration. And one other thing that did happen during the Depression was FDIC, where the Federal Deposit Insurance Company was formed to safeguard your money that you had in the bank, so it was safe to take it back out of your mattress and put it in the bank again. And, and they talked earlier in the thing about the different movies that came out, and some of them were some. Um, Snow White, The Seven Dwarfs, The Wizard of Oz, Stand Up and Cheer. I think Shirley Temple had a, a big thing during the Depression in that she was quite out there. And some of the music, brother, can you spare me a dime? And we're in the money. And nobody was in the money. <laughs> so that's about all I have on it. And I'm going to hand it over to Kathy or to whoever wants to. I, I could probably throw a question out. There were no soup lines locally here in, in, the, in the Centerville area. I, I know I was going through the old town records for the town of Newton. And, and back in, in the Depression era, we did have what they call a poor fund. And there were three people named that showed up there all the time, and they got something like two bucks a month or three bucks a month. It wasn't very much at all, and that came out of the town's poor fund. So, who and Fred, anybody going to talk about what took place here, or the shortages that took place? Like I said, my mother told me she couldn't get rubber and they couldn't get sugar. And the, the other thing she did mention was, well, we had the storm of 1936. Well, that added to the misery besides that. And at the same time, prohibition was going on. That went on from 1920 to 1935. So not only being miserable, you couldn't get a drink to drown your sorrows. So it's terrible. <laughs> Good job, Charlie. <laughs> now, as I was talking to Jerry earlier this week, and he was talking to his father-in-law, he is what, 94, 5? 94. 94, and he was saying that the, the market for pigs was, there was no market. They were totally worthless. So if you had hogs to ship to market, you better off just killing them, because you couldn't get anything for them. I'll turn over to Kathy. Kathy Sixel, I know that um, my parents always said that when the banks closed, you know, but I think they talked about that, but I think everybody did get their money after a while. It was good yet. They also wanted to go to a movie, and it was 10 cents, and they had a little bank from the bank, and my dad worked on it for hours to get the 10 cents out, but they couldn't get it out, so they couldn't go to the movie that night. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. I also have a letter from Paul Yeager. It's, um, let's see once. Oh, he wrote me two of them. He really didn't write about the depression. Is the mic off? No, the mic is off. Yeah. yeah. We're testing. It's got to be on. It's not on. Did I press the button? Is the green light on? Yes. Well, it should be on. But it doesn't work. 
part of the Greater Centerville Historians meeting on the 12th. I don't have much information on the Depression. My parents retired from the farm in 1930 and bought a house in Cleveland. That, I believe, was at the cost of $6,000. That was a lot of money already in 1930, I thought, for a house. Where did they live in Cleveland? Does anybody know what house they would have been in? Nobody? Oh, okay. And we have a gentleman here who has some information he'd like to identify himself. Go right ahead, please. Willard Mathias, on, on uh, the Jaeger place, it was where Gordon Pippard lives now, used to live, and it's now a Yost lives in, in that house. And uh, what street is that? Linden. Linden, uh, Linden Street, that's okay. what it is. All right. Right now. And what did he, what did he do for a living? It's, as far as I know, he never did anything. <laughs> he, he sold that farm, and I suppose that was enough money for him to retire on. Okay. But I know um, his son, what is his name? Paul. Paul. He lived there, too, and I, that's the only ones I knew that lived in that house. Where? Paul and his Where's mother and dad. What's that one? That's Got a gentleman here who knows a little bit more information on this subject. To go ahead, Ed, please. Uh, Frederick Jacoby. Well, uh, w regarding the Jaegers' farm, uh, Willie Jaeger sold his farm or turned it over to his son Clarence, who was probably newly married just then, uh, almost about that same time. I suppose that's when they did it. I don't know exactly. I was I wasn't even born then, but I know that. And uh, Willie just retired from farming. He was probably of retirement age when he okay. and he came out to the farm every day. You know how people did it in those days. That okay. was his. He came out and worked every day yeah. on his son's farm. And Paul was the younger brother. Okay. And then Paul went on and got a degree in agriculture, was a county agent for his career. Okay, good. Thank you. Ed? Okay. That oh, was a house was $6,000, and then I attended the center on the for, former Highway 141, then attended a Woodward Wilson Junior High in Manitowoc. Then the UW Madison. I was assistant county agent and then the county agent here in Kenosha County. I am now 91 years old. I only, mm, can't remember, don't know that, but I only that I recall about, the only thing I recall about the depression years is that I found out after the fact that my father had to borrow money to bring, buy a suit for uh, my confirmation at St. John St. Peter Lutheran Church in 1933, even though he was retired. While he was retired, he didn't have the cash at that time. Several of us rode with Bob Shout, that's what it looks like, to go to Manitowoc for junior and senior high. Some of the years there were eight in the car. Prices for the food were low compared to those in the 20s and now. I just now, I'm not just very helpful to you as I don't have good information about that period of time. And then I got the second letter. Another thing that came to mind after I wrote to you last evening, in 1928, the electric power company indicated they would provide electricity to the farm of five families in the immediate neighborhood if they would sign up. The rate for the Jaeger farm was 128 a month. The family bought an electric stove. In 1923, when the five years ended, my brother Clarence bought a wood stove, burning stove, burning stove again, so he could cut the cost of the monthly billing. In the village of Cleveland, my parents had 12 chickens, so they didn't have to buy eggs. Yours truly, Paul Jaeger. So I thought it was a very nice letter that he took the time to write it, so. Okay, thank you. And he, uh, Marie, what do you remember about the Depression years? <laughs> yeah, a question was asked uh, by uh, uh, Kathy for, to Marie. Uh, what do you remember about the Depression, if you got a thought? I, I uh, Marie Pippert, I just want to say that even last year, he comes, he comes back from Kenosha every year and goes down to the cemetery at Haika. His parents must be buried there because he always 
Dale always sees him there too. And he was, he hasn't been there this year yet, but he comes every year from Kenosha. And he drives back home at night yet. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. What do I remember? Not a heck of a lot because uh, we had everything too, like chicken and eggs. And uh, I just remember one time I was working for the dentist and I, I, I had on my, my black, uh, my white uniform. And I was mad at my brother and my mother wanted a chicken for supper. I thought, what the heck, I can sure kill a chicken. <laughs> well, I wouldn't try that again. That poor chicken, I almost had to saw his head off. That, <laughs> <laughs> that was so dull, I felt so sorry. Of course, my, I had to change my uniform, it was all full of blood. So that was my one adventure, I never tried that again. <laughs> but other than that, we had everything. Okay. We had apple trees and currants red and, and uh, white, uh, yellow ones, gooseberries, but everything under the sun in the garden. I think every, the only thing they bought was sugar, flour, and coffee. Okay. And they never threw anything away. Okay. And my mother made all the clothes and... Okay, so you had, you had clothes to go to school and yes. so forth, huh? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Anything with the vehicles uh, that they... Well, that my, my dad had the garage, so okay. when I was 16, boy, did I think I was something when I could take any car on the lot. <laughs> <laughs> when, uh, speaking of uh, doing work on vehicles at that time, was there any time that you had to extend uh, credit, if you will, oh, to sure. the people I... who uh, had things repaired? Well, I would tell, I could have a dirty story I could tell. Uh, I remember that. Can you put that mic a, a little bit closer down there? Yeah. There, there we go. I had to go in and collect once in a while. And uh, oh. even when I worked for Dr. Gartman as a dentist in Shipwake, sometimes the people paid a quarter that I collected, but that went good for, that was good for seven years then again. But I, I know I had to go for my dad too. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned it was good for seven years. Seven years. That one quarter would... Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Okay. Very yeah. good. Anything else that you would have... Uh... Well, everything was homemade. Everything was canned. There were no refrigerators. Okay. Okay. I still think it was good eating. Okay. <laughs> Very good, Marie. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, got a young lady here who would like to talk about uh, something in the past. Go right ahead, please. Uh, Edith, let's see, from Cleveland. Uh, I can remember my uh, uncle was working in Milwaukee and got laid off, and his wife and his two children came out by us because they didn't have anything to eat. Yeah, could, could you put the mic up oh. there, closer? They didn't have anything yeah, to eat. Good. So, uh, there was my father and my mother, grandma and grandpa, the hired man, and five children, and then those three from Milwaukee, his his wife and two kids came out so that they would, we all had something to eat on the farm. And well, those kids were the same age as what we were, and we got into a lot of trouble. So <laughs> I was 10 years old at that time, and, okay. and uh, the other, one of them, was maybe 12 and one was 13, I think, of the children. Okay. But I can remember that so well. My mother, I don't know how my mother always got all that food ready because that was a lot of people at the table every day. Okay. Very good. Thank you. <coughs> Got a gentleman here, please? Uh, Frederick Jacoby. I, as long as we're talking about the Yeager family, I'm uh, about as expert as you're going to get Clarence Yeager and Willie Yeager's family because I looked across the road and Howard and I were together all our life. Um, and uh, they're buried um, on the Casa Cemetery. Uh, Paul's uh, wife, is, Charlotte, is, is buried there too. Um, and then there were, Clarence had an older brother, uh, Walter, and um, he graduated from Antwerp High School in 1917, the same year as my father, and uh, went on into business, became very successful. And I think it was uh, the telephone company or like Western Electric. It, it was something like that. He was, uh, he was like a, it, you know, he made it good. It was, he was a good businessman. He lived in Walwood. His address was Walwatos, I remember. Um, then there was uh, one, one girl in the Yeager family, and that was uh, Adelaide Yeager, who married Victor Stoltenberg, who a lot of you, a lot of you might remember Adelaide and Victor. Uh, and Paul, 
The reason you may not have seen him now for a while is because he had a very bad winter and he's uh, living in an assisted living home and I, I'm quite certain he's not driving anymore. Uh, he, but he had up until last fall, yeah. Thank you. Well, I got some more. Oh, good. <laughs> well, some related things. I remember that the story that I heard the most often from my father was he bought the farm in 1923. And uh, those first years weren't the best either because they were coming off uh, World War I, unemployment was uh, a problem. So that wasn't the best either, but then there was that boom later in the 20s and that was stock market, it was paper, a lot of it was paper, money on paper. And, um, but he, he talked about uh, during the height of the depression not having any money. And uh, well, I was born in 31, I knew we didn't have any money. Um, but you know, we, being on the farm, you, uh, you ate well. You know, that's well, the way it was. My mother was an excellent seamstress, made all my clothes, uh, girls' clothes, all that. And I remember the one thing my father said, and I must have heard it a hundred times, that at J.C. Penney they had Oshkosh, um, by gosh, bib overalls mm -hmm. on sale for 98 cents. Mm -hmm. But he didn't have 98 cents to buy them, even though they were a terrific bargain. Uh, you know, that's the way it was. Okay. He had a mortgage on the farm when he bought it. And uh, the mortgage in those days, bankers didn't give uh, farm mortgages. The, uh, bankers mostly didn't give money to people that needed it in those, in those days. That's kind of an overstatement, a joke, but it was, there was more truth than not to it. Uh, they gave money to where it was, uh, to people that had money where it was more safe. See? Yeah. And um, so you got private mortgages from uh, relatives. Uh, mostly, and my father had one from a, a distant relative, and uh, so then he got into the depression, and making the interest payments were a struggle, and so uh, things were good, and the man was generous, and uh, that was fine, but then he died, and his son took over the mortgage, and that was not good. He was very strict and very demanding. And um, so then as soon as Roosevelt set up some uh, uh, fire mortgage plans, uh, some that are still uh, used today, uh, then my father got into one of those mortgage plans. OK. Thank you. Thank you, Selma. I can remember that when my parents uh, had gotten this farm. Their children came from Germany and this family had six sons and he bought a section of land near out of Sheboygan Falls near Waldo and each son was given the same amount of acres and so they had 50 acres and that's what they farmed with with the few cows, probably 12, uh, all of their lives, and uh, they uh, retired and ended up in Cleveland okay. so they could be near, near us. <laughs> okay, very good. Thank you, Tom. Ed, please. Uh, what, what, uh, Gordon Mathias. Thank you. What I remember of, of the old days is that when uh, my brothers and uh, were talking about it, they were saying, that we never knew there was a depression. We, we had a dairy, and we had, my dad had 14 farmers that brought the milk there, mm -hmm. and uh, when he needed wood to, for the stove or for the factory, he would, a longhorn cheese would cover a lot of wood. And then they'd always negotiate different things. Okay. We raised our own pigs, we raised uh, pigs, we had four of them, the five. We had our chickens, geese, whatever you wanted. Okay. We had mink. Mink. Okay. And uh, we did everything that uh, made a living on, we had it. So, I mean, I remember Sundays we'd have a chicken, and uh, during the winter we'd have ice cream. We, would, uh, we just never uh, had to suffer on anything because okay. we had it. Uh, oh, right. And if we didn't have it, one of the farmers would have it. You know, would, uh, my mother canned everything that we ate, so uh, we never really 
realize there was a depression. Okay. And as far as uh, what we were talking about before about that milk strike. Yes. In our dairy, I remember my dad telling me he had the vat was put the milk in, and the guys came in and he says, "You can make this batch of cheese yet today, but tomorrow you make a batch of cheese. We're going to be here, and we're going to pour acid in it." You will not make cheese until we tell you again. So, and Dad, the next day, he told the farmers that I can't take your milk because they're going to put acid in the milk. So he waited a couple of days, and then he started up again, and they never came back. But uh, like you said, uh, I can't understand that the farmers were dumping their own milk when they were bringing it over by my dad in the cheese factory to make cheese out of it yet. Mm -hmm. But uh, how things change nowadays, you know, uh, it, it just uh, isn't real that they would do something like that to mm -hmm. spoil all that milk and uh, give it away rather than uh, pour acid in it. So that's all I got to say. No, I, I have one more question for you. Uh, who was the people that warned you or warned your dad? I, I don't remember that. But okay. uh, like you said about the prices on... on uh, when, we, when I was a kid, we delivered the milk house to house seven days a week, eight cents a quart, four cents a pint. And you wanted cottage cheese, it cost you four cents a pound. I can remember that because I used to make it. It was an uh, easy thing to make. Uh, and uh, you would drain it, and then the people would be waiting with their little buckets and come in and got their, their cottage cheese. Okay. So. Very good. Thank you. Very well, this is loud. <laughs> I'm a loud person. Okay. I, I want to comment on what Willard said because my mother, well, I, I was sitting in the swing talking to my mother this morning and she basically said the same thing. You did not know that there was a depression going on and one of the reasons is everybody knows about the oil spill down there because it's on television every three to five minutes. Nobody had the TV. We weren't constantly reminded that the depression is going on, that you're miserable. The movies were all upbeat. The songs were all upbeat. And when Willard mentioned I said, that's what my mother said. And, and one other thing is the oldest child always got the new clothes. Yeah. And then it, it, got, it got patched and handed down, but it was always clean. You could wear patched clothes as long as it was clean. It had to be clean. But it was dirty, well, that was a different thing. <laughs> now, when I was going through the newspapers, on November 6th in 1929, I found this little thing here. If you look at the screen, I'm going to have to pick it up to read it. But it, it's, it's uh, to show the greatest improvement in cheese factories. And we're just talking about cheese factories. I'm just going to read this one little paragraph in here. It says, meetings of the Kiwanis Club last night was turned over to the county phase of the cheese factory grounds improvement contest. The prize winners for Manitowoc County were announced as the Farmers Cooperative Corporation of Tisch Mills, Emil Sonnenberg of Cato, John Hintz of Centerville, and Oscar Nestor of Maples Grove, and Ben Henningson of Gibson. I thought that was kind of neat. I found this by accident. I find a lot of things just by accident, you know. And the other thing here is a stump puller. They're advertising and where it's highlighted. Now we'll pass that around. And, and they're looking for endorsements here. And William Bartell of Centerville endorses this stump puller. And Fred was saying that a Bartell had a cheese factory, or that name shows up at the cheese factory at County X and Union Road across from Brian Kramer. Yeah. Bartle. Bartle. Am I saying that right? So I'm, I'm going to pass these back around again. Charlie? Yes. Fred wants the mic. Okay, you got a gentleman here who has a, he'd like to introduce himself and bring about some more information about the Depression, perhaps. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Frederick Zakovi. Uh, no, Bartles, the, the cheese factory. Okay. When, when the town, Centerville, was celebrating its 100, was it 150th anniversary a few years ago when this all got started? Mm -hmm. All right. You had a display of stuff at the firehouse or what did the town hall, what do you call it? And I was looking at it and there were a couple people there, a couple ladies, and they were 
Bartles or related to the Bartles, and they there was information there about them, and they were very interested. And and before that, I didn't know that that ever was a name up there, you know, because it was something that went past me. I never. I think first of all, it was East. Okay, go right ahead and leave. Le Kathy Six O. We're okay. talking about the cheese factory. Bartles Cheese Factory, it first was a sawmill and it was located on the corner of X and Union Road. And later it became the Cheese Factory. And I think it ended up with the clo uh, Clover Leaf or Clover something Cheese Factory. And I think that uh, Ed Finkelmeyer was a cheese maker there. And uh, something happened to them. I guess he lost his job or the depression came. And he lived with, or the whole family lived with uh, my in laws, Florence and Art Sixel, at that time. So. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Go right ahead, please. Uh, Lisa Elfson of Newton. Uh, my great grandmother lived next door to me, which is microphone. Oh, sorry. Which is Charlie's grandmother, my great grandmother, and uh, my great grandmother used to say that when people could not pay the bills for the General Star that they ran, they also had a culvert business and the farm, and so people would give them items. So when Grandma died, we went through her attic. She would have anything from zithers to um, really odd items that were never, really never in the family because people would pay their bills with just giving them items because they didn't want to starve. And um, she also said, of course, that the people who had chickens, they would have the uh, come to buy the feed from them and, of course, the fabric from the chicken feed sacks and the flour sacks were made into either clothing or um, dish towels, that sort of thing. Okay, very good. Thank you. Got a lady here who would like to speak a few words. Go right ahead, please. Audrey Ertl. Thank you. My father bought the cheese factory February 1st, 1926. And he had lived in the town of, Cent of Sheboygan, so he did his banking at Howard's Grove. So when he moved to the cheese factory, he kept his money at the bank at Howard's Grove. Well, when the bank closed, Howard's Grove closed, he moved his money to Cleveland, because Cleveland never closed. Okay. And I remember my brother and I had savings accounts, and we lost the money in the savings account, but I could have been about 15, 16, maybe 17 years old, and my brother was 18 months younger than I was. We got checks from the Howard's Grove Bank for like a dollar some cents, 87 cents. I don't know how often, but I know they used to come until the money that we had in our savings account was paid for. Okay. Wow. Very good. Okay. And yeah, right ahead. I don't think we ever, we had electricity because of the factory, so the, the house had electricity, the house was heated by the factory, and uh, we had our own chickens. I don't think we realized that there was a depression. And I know my parents, or mostly my mother, would take us to the movies once in a while. Of course, we had to go to the kind that she liked, and she only liked Shirley Temple or Jeanette McDonald and Nelson Eddy. So those were the movies that we saw at that time. Very good. Thank you for sharing. Hold it. Do one more time. I'm Alice Mathias. Thank you. Uh, I was born up in Marathon County, and when my when I was two years old, I had six sisters and one brother, and my folks moved to Manitowoc, and they took all their belongings and went on the train. Couldn't I can't still figure out. Uh, how many belongings did we have? It <laughs> could have been a whole lot. But anyhow, then my dad came to Manitowoc. He got a job at the Goods. That was mural company years back. And I believe we they made the move because of the Depression. He was a farmer up north and uh, evidently didn't make enough money to raise the family. Okay. And uh, we never had a lot of money. I remember using food stamps that during the war when you had those books or whatever. And uh, we all, the whole family was able to go to Catholic school and all graduate from high school. They were always very pleased with that. Good. Thank you. Got a gentleman here who raised his hand. He might have a thought or two to share here. Go right ahead. John Wiegand. <clears throat> My father was born in 1921. He should be here tonight instead of me. But uh, 
His, his parents were married in 1910, just exactly 100 years ago this year. Okay. And my grandmother mentioned several times probably that when they got married, some of her sisters made fun of her for marrying a farmer. And then in the 1930s came along, they, were, they all lived in the city, Sheboy and her surrounding areas. They came out and got produce from the garden because they <coughs> were you know, broke. Yeah. And <coughs> they probably didn't pay anything, they just took it. But, uh, well, that's the way it was. I guess farmers helped out their city friends in sure. those years. Sure. <coughs> My father often mentions the fact, he talks about when you go on the church parking lot today, all the fancy vehicles out there. He said in the 1930s, some of those cars that were there were so bad you wondered how they ever got home with them. Because, I mean, they were just that they couldn't move yet. He said his father never, and he wasn't that poor, his, his father never bought a new car, always bought a used car. And uh, talking about uh, Willard Matthias was mentioning uh, farmers before. <clears throat> My dad mentioned there was one farmer in the area, every time he went to the cheese factory, he, he took his gun along, his shotgun, you know, <clears throat> make sure he made it there and back again. Okay. And I, my grandfather was on the town board, he was the town chairman actually, and, and the county board for eight years in the 30s, and I, I guess Gudley Herman must have been just getting started then. Uh, Gudley Herman had an approach to the town board asking for help to, for his business, which you wouldn't <coughs> believe now anymore, but uh, that's, that's the way things were. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you for sure. Okay, we got a young lady who'd like to say a few words, but she'd like to introduce herself also. Go right ahead. Marilyn Heineman. The one thing I remember um, my mom mentioning, uh, her family was quite poor, and my dad's family was a little better off. And she, I know when she got married, she said she felt like she had moved into a palace because she didn't have electricity or running water or anything in her house. Okay. But um, she said when she was little, you were talking about clothes. Everybody always had really nice stuff for Sunday. And she didn't have anything to wear for Sunday, so her mother cut apart her wedding dress and dyed it green and made a dress for my mother to wear to church. And she said she remembers her crying when she cut it apart because they didn't, they didn't have you know, yeah. any money to, yeah. for her clothes. Um, and then my um, mom's uncle, um, John, said, me, uh, mentioned, I know we, they always said he lost money in the Howard's Grove Bank, uh, I guess about $7,000 he lost that he wow. had the bank. Wow. Somebody stole it. Oh, somebody, somebody, somebody ran off with it. Oh, somebody stole it. <laughs> <laughs> One of the so bank that, officials. <laughs> so um, that, that was some of the things that I guess... Someone here who would like to share uh, some information, he'd like to identify himself. Uh, Melvin Walk. Good. And uh, the stories that I have are not my stories, it's just I'm 72 years old, but these are stories that I heard. And uh, uh, first of all, I mentioned to my brother-in-law in the town of Mimi the other night that I was coming here tonight and telling him about it's going to be discussion on the Depression. And then he just mentioned to me, which one? The 30s or the one that we're getting into now? <laughs> but anyway, uh, just a uh, story a couple friends of mine that had told me stories. Some of these people have passed on. But there was a, a gentleman farmer out in the town of uh, Mimi, uh, right off of Russ Road. There's a dead-end road that goes to the west, uh, Harvey Yunko. And uh, he told me the story when uh, he raised hogs, and of course it was Depression years, and uh, he took them to the pig fair in Plymouth. And he threw, or not threw, but put eight young uh, hogs, so 40-pounders, in his truck wagon and went to Plymouth and didn't sell any, because nobody was buying hogs even for 25 cents a piece. And on the way back, coming back on Highway 67, and there used to be a bar right out of uh, Plymouth. He had 25 cents, he stopped there and went into the bar, and he had a beer and a sandwich, and he came home and backed up to the hog barn on his farm, only to find out he had 15 hogs in his trailer. Somebody just wanted to get rid of them. They couldn't, didn't want to feed them. So they threw them in his tra trailer and he put them in the home. You know. Good. Just one other, one other little story. Another friend of mine, he's, he's 86 years old and raised in Sheboygan. And uh, he was always farmed out to the farm, to an uncle's farm up north 
in summer for room and board only, you know. And of course, it's all of a sudden it's the depression. And now the thing was, his dad had a car, but he didn't use it because he couldn't afford a, a lot of gasoline, and he didn't have license on it. So how am I going to get Bob up to up north this summer to the uncle's farm? So what he did, the uncle sent him the license plate off of his car down to Sheboygan. They put it on her, and that's how he got, and that's the way he got home after a while too. You know what I mean? And I would assume that in the 30s, that license, car license, probably weren't more than three, four, five dollars at the very most. I don't, I, you know. So, but. That there you can see how tight yeah. those dollar bills were. Okay. Very good. Good. Thank you for sharing. There we go. Go right ahead, please, and identify yourself. I'm Elaine Walk. My parents were married in 1928 uh, in the town of Herman. Okay. And my mother's brother and father bought the farm for my parents. Then my oldest brother was born in 30, another one 32, 34. I was born in 1938. But I can remember my dad always being happy that each year they at least could pay the interest on the note on the farm okay. that they had borrowed. All right. And before my parents were married, they both had worked in Sheboygan at different jobs, so they had friends from the city. Now they were on the farm, and many of those friends would visit them because they had nothing, yeah. and they at least would get a meal. Sure. We had chickens, and on a Saturday, you would see my mother butchering six, eight chickens, and she would sell them either to the neighbors or ladies from the city. And then the flower bags were cloth, okay. and their dish towels were made of, if it had a pretty design or border on. And Okay. Uh, we had a good life, but plenty of food, plenty of work. Many a time you walked home from school and the pantry would be full of dirty dishes from all day. And there I, I was the only girl in the okay. family washing all those dishes because my mother always had to help in the barn with the milking or the field work. Oh. Yeah. But one story, my husband and I, we had four daughters, and now this is in the 60s. And the youngest daughter, when she w the hand-me-down clothes, <laughs> and when she was three years old, she got a new orange sweater. She kept that on for three days because <laughs> she was so happy with that. <laughs> Thank you. Very good. Thank you. We have a gentleman who would like to continue with those wonderful stories. Go right ahead. Melvin Walk, that Thank daughter you. that was deprived all her life, her young life, of a sweater. Uh, she graduated with a degree in chemical engineering, and she also has a law degree, and now she's got a law office in Houston, Texas, so she can buy her sweaters. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, you got a gentleman here? Go right ahead, please. Larry Brookshin. Thank you. I was talking to my dad a little bit about what happened, and he doesn't remember the Depression as much as the rationing. I think the rationing came from World War II with the mm -hmm. ration books. Yeah, he had yeah. ration gas and sugar. And he says they had a hold. They got a hold of a couple hundred pounds of sugar, and they put it in the hay mow, and then they covered it up with straw. And then when they were, when they come around and ask you need sugar, well, I'll need more sugar. Not saying that they had it somewhere in the, in the in the barn, but then when people got married, they would come over, get a couple cups of sugar to make the wedding cakes or or whatever they would have. Okay. And the gas. Well, being on a farm, the farmers got more gas, so he would always ask for more gas and put it in the cars. So he always he always had plenty of stuff. There. But I think the farmers they could take care of themselves. They had the food, they had gardens, so they really were never yeah. like the people in the city were having more effect on the depression than what the people in the, in the country did. I think so that's sure. all I could get out of them. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, thank you. I got a young lady here who uh, had some recall, and it's kind of unique, and she'd like to identify herself. Naomi Schmidt. I can recall, because we always had a lot of uh, cottage cheese we put on bread and put carrot syrup on top. Yeah. And the one day I was, uh, a number of years ago, I was talking to somebody about that, and he says, oh, that used to be called the depression sandwich. 
Huh? I couldn't know anything about it. I still eat it to this day. Oh, good. <laughs> good. Thank you. Got a gentleman here who would like to speak up a little bit. Go right ahead, please. I'm Walter Gress, and I live down in Hika Village. Yes. We had chickens, too, and I own eggs and that. My dad worked for a railroad company in Sheboygan. and we were 12 hours a week. That's in 1935 and through there when I went to high school. Uh -huh. We used to drive in with them. And in 1940, I started to work at Bullard for 40 cents an hour. Holy cow. Okay. During the Depression years. We bought a new car for a thousand bucks. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Uh, when when you mentioned the uh, pig thing, uh, that they were not worth anything, I did talk with my father-in-law, Ruben Gotts, and he's going to be 95 this August, and I asked him if he knew anything. And he says, yes. Getting rid of pigs was a big problem, and he uh, called the cattle per person who purchased that type of thing, and he said, he, the guy come out, and he says, yes, I'll uh, get rid of the pigs for you, but uh, you have to sell me one of your cows besides. And he says, okay, it's a deal, and he had like seven or eight pigs also, and a pretty fair size, but he says he, he couldn't visualize what happened next. He says, the guy gave him a dollar for each of the pigs, but yet he would purchase the cow, and he shot the pigs right there and left it and said, now you bury them. So, so that apparently the pork was not the commodity they were looking for. And the only other story I have in regard to my dad, and uh, he was born in 1901, and he had money in Newton Bank, and there was no problem. He had plenty of money in there that he had saved up during his bachelor years. And uh, when that decree, or whatever you want to call it, came through from the national government about shutting down the banks, now on the tape or film, they indicated it was about four days, but he says it was like a couple of months. And he had to borrow, he had money a little bit at home, but nothing major, and he had to borrow a few dollars from his sister-in-law. And he says that was the toughest thing for him to do, to go you know, to a relative and borrow the money, knowing that he had it in the bank, but he couldn't touch it. But he says uh, it did loosen up that he was able to get to that account after a while. Thank you. Okay, we got a young lady who raised her hand, and I think she has some information. Go right ahead, please. I'm Margie Ertl. Now, I don't know if this was right after the Depression. It might have been a little bit later in the 30s. But my mother helped my dad with the bookkeeping of, at the cheese factory. And she would get so upset when the farmers didn't cash their checks. They would save their checks until the church, their books went till November 30th. Some of the stores, like uh, Table and different stores went yeah. to November 30th. Yeah. So the farmers saved their checks until November 30th and then paid their bills. And they they never cashed their checks and she always had to carry these checks forward every yeah. month. Yeah. And that used to irritate her no end. So I don't know how much depression there was around our area. <laughs> I agree, I agree. Thank you. Okay, got a gentleman here who uh, has addition to uh, can let us know about right ahead. Mother Matthias, when uh, she was talking about having uh, farmers not cashing their checks, we had the same problem at our dairy. My dad used to get all excited all the time. Here's the, every month you go through your checking account and they didn't cash your checker. And, and it would go on until the end of the year and then all of a sudden they'd have to, they'd cash their checks to pay their bills. Okay. And I suppose their taxes and everything, but they had the money, but they just didn't cash the checks. Why? I don't know. That right. wouldn't happen nowadays. <laughs> Thank you. Got a gentleman here who raised his hand. Go right ahead, please. Uh, Frederick Jacoby. Uh, when uh, Walter Kress told about earning 40 cents an hour at Valroth, I remembered that elsewhere Shooty, which was the oldest of the Shooty kids, Kitty Corner on the farm, and X and Centerville Road there, um, told me a number of years ago, uh, all three boys at one time or another were in the CCCs, so I'm not sure how that fell into place, but I think after, you could only be in the 
you could only serve so many short terms in the CCCs. And um, so then he had, was working for uh, a rather prosperous farmer near Howard's Grove and as a farmhand. Mm -hmm. And somebody from Sheboygan would always stop in and pick up eggs and stuff like that at, at this farmer. And he was a foreman at Kohler. And so at one point in 1839, he offered him a job and offered Ellsworth a job, this foreman. And Ellsworth uh, said, yes, he'd be very happy to take it. And he's, I said to him, and it, this is really, really striking. I said, uh, do you remember how much you earned? He says, I sure do. He said, 25 cents an hour. And I thought I was a rich man. Oh. He told me that about a couple years before he died. Okay. Now, I've got some more stories, but I don't want to intrude if somebody else has. i got some stories about my some of our family in Dakota thinking of moving here and all that kind of stuff. Because okay. You've got a one or two. We'll all right. start into it a little bit. All right. We have a bunch of letters that uh, I've only came all across a few years ago. I found that uh, my mother had saved... Uh, see, my mother grew up in the middle of South Dakota, and she still had two sisters there. And uh, so they wrote letters all the time. And uh, they wrote a lot of letters those days. And so um, these letters told a story uh, in the 35, 36, when the, the dust storms were so bad out west, and it was dry and hot here in the summer of 36, after the snowstorm of 35, you know, that winter. Mm -hmm. And they couldn't find work. Now, the one family tried to make it uh, farming, and it was, boy, it was not going good. And they weren't considering any drastic move, because I suppose they could grow enough, but there, there was no water. The trees were dying. It's all in those letters. Uh, trees that had lived, you know, a long time, were big trees, were dying. Uh, they were people were calling out the vets, the vet to see what was on their horse, and, and the vet said, you got you to gotta put them down, because there wasn't enough to eat or drink. But the other family had no children. They, they went with, uh, they were childless for many of their first uh, years of married. And he was a mechanic and just earning such a little bit of money. And she was working 12 hours a day, seven days a week in a, a little restaurant. And so they wondered, and they had made plans. One of, there were two different plans that showed up in those letters. One was to come and just come and move to our farm and live there, and my uncle would have helped my father, I suppose, on the farm, and my aunt would have helped with other, the gardening and everything, and they could have lived there, you know, and with, there would be enough to eat, you know. That was, that's a sh short version of that story. But they didn't do that either, and they never made the big move. And the other one was a plan that they would fill up their car with uh, canning jars, and come here in early fall and okay. uh, fill up a can, enough stuff, and then drive back to Dakota. Uh, and th these were, th these were not, this was, these letters were serious, you know. They, those were serious plans, but they didn't do it. They never got that far. But, it, but in Dakota, nothing would grow. It was, those letters are, are very uh, mm. telling. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Here we get rain once in a while, you know, <laughs> <laughs> or you could water from a well or yeah, a creek. Right, right. Thank you. Yeah, the gentleman who said he's got a couple things to talk about. Right ahead, please. Charlie Bauer Newton. Um, the, the only thing that I was going to comment about the, the videotape that we watch here about the rioting in Washington D.C. against the the veterans of World War One. I, I I I had no idea that took place. I was just appalled at that that they got shortchanged out of their bonus, and that was probably the only reason they joined the service, because they knew they were going to get the bonus money. And then, who was the general? Mac MacArthur? MacArthur. Yeah. And he ended up to be the World War II hero. Uh, you know, it's just, <laughs> it's unbelievable. And the other thing I, I found out, and, and we didn't talk about it at all here tonight, was the, the, the people that caught the freight trains, you know, and went out west to either pick fruit or harvest the vegetables, and they were called hobos. Does anybody know where that word came from, how that came about? And I found this out just by accident again, because I was wondering, now why, why call him a hobo? 
Where did that come from? Yeah. And that's a that's a takeoff of another word that was um, after the slaves were freed during the Civil War. The the slaves were out looking for work, and most of the men would put a hole on their shoulder, and they would go from one place to another place, and they were called the hole boys because they carried a hole. Okay. And somewhere along the line, that word got bastardized, and when the people started jumping the trains looking for work, that's how that word came about. They called them hobos. And I, I found that in one of the things I was looking up on the Depression here. I thought that was quite interesting. That's yeah. the first time I, I heard yeah, about I that. I never heard of that, Charlie. Very good. Thank that's you. That's all I got. Good. Science. Thank you. When he mentioned hobos, I remember living in town. Every once in a while, I would get off the railroad, and they'd go knocking on your door. And I know my mother would always give them a sandwich, they'd sit outside, and then they'd be on their way again. Mm -hmm. And then you mentioned like the rag man. Yep. When we lived in town, we always called those the sheenies. The sheenies. Yeah. Okay. And they would come around buying your rags, rags, right? Okay. They bought rags and they sold peaches and fruit All, and things. They, okay. Okay. Thank you. That's it. Okay, we got a young lady who said she had uh, something to add here. Lisa Elson from Newton. Thank you. The great grandmother that had the general store, um, when the gypsies would come around, it would be like wildfire because they tried to get into the barn, they'd steal some food, um, they were just rascals. And so they would have a little calling session that my great grandmother would call the next neighbor and the neighbor would call the next neighbor um, or send word that the gypsies were around and they'd all close their doors. Okay. Um, but also grandma would say too that when she ever got a, a homemade dress, it was brand new, that's, that's what you wore for Sundays. When it got to be a little older, you wore it for every day. Then when it got to be a little raggier, you cut the sleeves off and that was your slip. And then when the slip didn't fit anymore, that was cut up to rags or a, for quilts. Wow, wow, great story. Thank you. I got a gentleman here who raised his hand. We want to know what he's all about. He'd like to identify himself. I'm Don Schneider from Lewis Corners. Thank you. Uh, when I was a kid, well, this is a kind of a long story, but anyway, um, I lived with my grandmother, and we're talking about gypsies, and I just used to love them. Um, they had some beautiful wagons, they had beautiful horses, they were uh, very colorful people, and they would come up to the farm, and my grand I lived with my grandmother, and she would give them something to they eat a couple of sandwiches or something, and they never bothered us. But boy, they had some beautiful music. And I tell you, they had accordions, and I tell you, they were beautiful people. And we never had any problems with the gypsies. Okay. Uh, I just used to love them, and uh, I used to catch a lot of hell because I used to try and sneak down there at night and just listen to them. <laughs> and they camped down in the woods and on the farm. And, okay. Uh, uh, also, okay, one quick question in regard to gypsies. What country or what area did they come from to start out with? Uh, they were, uh, I think they were either Armenians or Romanians or from, uh, most of them were, uh, I don't think they were Austrians, I don't think, but they were from, uh, most of them were from uh, uh, around Germany someplace over there. Okay. But they were beautiful looking people. And uh, beautiful horses, beautiful wagons, everything was painted, and it seemed all they do was drink and dance before they sure had a good time. <laughs> <laughs> Anything I used, else? I used to enjoy that. <laughs> okay. I interrupted you. You had a thought or two there that you were going to indicate? Oh, I'm talking about hobos? Yes. Okay. Um, when, when I was younger, um, the hobos were around, I, I lived around the Keel area, and they had a, what they called a tramp hole. It was a place underneath, like a railroad bridge, by Lowndes a Furniture Factory down on the south end of Kiel. Okay. And these hobos would um, come and they'd camp there overnight or whatever, and they'd come into town and then they'd mark on the sidewalk where somebody would give them a sandwich or something. They had a chalk, a piece of chalk, and the people would come. Well, these hobos would come and they knew what house they could get some food. Then they'd go back down to that tramp hole. They had uh, like a campfire and stuff and they would stay. They'd come on the railroad mm -hmm. on the boxcars and then they'd stay there for a day or two and then they'd move on again. And uh, so I, I knew a lot about hobos because they used to be killed quite a bit. Okay. Good. And, uh, Good. Keep going. Okay. Uh, we're talking about wages. Uh, 
Uh, my sister Mutsi here, she can tell uh, tell you the same thing. Um, I have my social security card here that I got when I was 13 years old. And uh, I didn't know just how far we walked, but we walked from Kiel to Nolstein to work in a canning factory. I was 13 years old and I got 13 cents an hour. And I remember that the rest of my life because I was 13 and 13 cents. Well, now, I don't know how much Mutsi got, but she probably got 14, I don't know. <laughs> she probably got the same, I don't know. But we had a walk. But we walked. We walked to work um, three and a half, was it? Four miles to the It wasn't always the best, you okay. know, but we made it. What did the candy company specialize in? Uh, they made, uh, we, they canned peas. Hip, hip peas candy oh, yeah. company, peas. Okay, yes. Yeah, and I still had the stencils. Um, from the, that we put on the wooden boxes. At that time, it was wooden boxes. Weren't car Some of them were cardboard then already, but most of them were wooden boxes. Okay, okay. How many hours a day were you involved in I, that? I believe we only worked eight hours a day because we weren't old enough to work. Uh, oh. And they had the, at that time, they had the German prisoners which stayed at the, um, they stayed at the campground at, uh, or the fairgrounds at Plymouth. And the bus would bring the German prisoners up to uh, canning company and I got fired twice because I spoke German to a couple of them and a uh, foreman would fire me and then Oma and Hippie would come along and come back to the house uh, to Kiel again and hire me back again because uh, um, the foreman, we weren't allowed to speak to the uh, German oh. prisoners at that time. Okay. And, uh, but uh, well, I had a good time. Okay, very good. Thank you for sharing. He had a gentleman raise his hand. He has something to share. Go right ahead, please. John Wiegan. Thank you. <clears throat> Some of you remember uh, old John Kerber who used to live down the road here a little ways. He started farming in the 30s in the area here. He said once <clears throat> when he was young he couldn't afford a beer, and then when he got old he couldn't drink it anymore, so he didn't get much out of that. But <laughs> And <clears throat> my dad's uncle was Kurt Wiegan. He used to live where Jack Schnelli does across the road from where we live now. He went to Cleveland, took his son Leroy along when he was a kid. Leroy was a kid. And on the way home they went past Wimler's Tavern there and he, he said to his son, I'd, I'd like to buy you an ice cream but I can't afford to. So they went home without it. Right. A little bit about a certain era. Go right ahead. Marie Pippert. I remember Wimler's used to have movies on Saturday night. And it w would always end. Pearl White, I remember, was one of them. And she'd be on the railroad track, the train would be coming. Of course, yeah. then it would end, then you'd have to go the next Saturday. And that was oh. 10 cents. And they used to have Chautauqua walk. Chautauquas there, too, at Wigner's Hall. What was that called again? Chautauquas. What is that? Like, uh, almost like movies, but not like live stuff. Live. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. okay. And I think everybody remembers uh, Doobills that we had years ago and from Priney's. Is that a store or what is that? No, Priney. Don't you remember Priney's yeah. store? <laughs> Everybody remembers Priney's. <laughs> you took stuff there. Oh. And uh, like cabbage and uh, eggs and, and oh, okay. uh, potatoes and tulips and strawberries. And yeah. then you got a doobell. And I remember one time I got a nice winter green coat with a fur boy that I think that was something out oh. of a doobell. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, they always had a beautiful Christmas decoration too, Pranies. Okay. Everybody good. went down there to watch that. Okay. And I also remember the last time I worked for uh, two dentists, I got twelve fifty a week. Twelve fifty a week. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Thank you. Oh, Go. <laughs> okay. Good. What do you want to know? Your name, first of all, again? <laughs> Marie Pepper. Thank you, Marie. But, uh, of course, we danced all over Wimler's Hall and Nenex Hall. Okay. And um, Hitzler's Hall. And I remember that the beer was 10 cents. Okay. And when, uh, when I could drive, I could take a lot of girls along. And I remember Abby Brustoff said her mother gave her $1. And that was enough for a round for the five of us. <laughs> <laughs> For a beer. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But uh, we went to a lot of dances and roller skated. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. Very good. I still think those were nice times. Very good. Thank good you. Good eating. Good eating. Hi, Jerry. I got something. Yeah. Sure. Okay, got a gentleman here who raised his hand. Go right ahead, please. 
uh, Frederick Jacoby, um, you know, about the um, programs that were put in place at the national level to give people jobs. Yep. Um, as a result of that, if, when you go to state and national parks, and you see these roads with all the posts around them, down the road, and all the roads fact, uh, there, and the field houses, that was all part of one of these programs, maybe the WPA, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. Other things were uh, uh, post offices were built, libraries were built, uh, you know, to, to give people jobs. Sure. Um, gymnasiums at schools that didn't have them, things, so a lot of those things are still to be seen, mm -hmm. and the result of that. Okay, very good, thank you. Got a young lady here again, and she'd like to uh, maybe address this with a, a fun a final thing, if you will. Um, my name is Kathy Sixley, yes, and I would like to say a final thing, as I was to the uh, library, I think for Ho Herbert Hoover, and they thought that he I think I've got the right name. They thought that he was the one that uh, was at the fault of the depression, but it really wasn't. He was in finances, and he had advised the, the people already at that time that the nation was going to fail. And I don't know, has anybody else been to that library down in Iowa? It's quite interesting. Oh. Well, we're going to wind down now. And uh, Larry, I want to thank you for the topic. He suggested it, and it's been very nice. And Anybody else have any suggestions for any topics or for something that we can pursue? And uh, to tell you the truth, I've, I haven't worked on next month yet. I'm thinking about it, so uh, it'll be so a uh, surprise for all, including me. <laughs> so, <laughs> good night, and uh, again, thank you all for coming, and I hope to see you all next month. Okay, very good. Paul Jacoby. Thank you, Paul. Lisa Alfson. Thank you very much. Good job tonight. Ellsworth Yeager. Thank you. Rick Weirsdorf. Thank you. Kathy Wagner. Thank you. Walter Chris. Thank you, Walter. Sorry. Naomi Schmidt. Thank you, Naomi. Mary Wolfel. Thank you. Don Schneider. Thank you. Larry Brookshin. Good. Melvin Walk. Thank you. Elaine Walk. Thank you. Lord Matthias. Thank you. Alice Matthias. Thank you. Irene Dine. Thank you. <coughs> Audrey Erdl. Thank you. Earl Elders. Thank you. John Wiegand. Thank you. Marilyn Heineman. Thank you. Salma Vogel. Thank you. Marie Pippert. Thanks for coming. Edith Lutze. Good. Frederick Jacoby. Thank you. Charlie Bauer Newton. Thank you. Charlie. And Jerry O'Neill, the videographer. And I want to thank everybody also for uh, coming this evening and providing a lot of good information from something that is uh, getting lost in the past. So we appreciate all your efforts to bring it back to life. Thank you. You've got to remember, you've got to keep buying the junk with the money that you don't have or you're going to have a depression. <laughs> <laughs> it works. <laughs>